So the last theorem that we want to look at in this section is the intermediate value theorem. And this is one that says that if we've got a continuous function on a closed interval, um, so that's our function f that we're indicating just here. So if it's continuous on a closed interval a, b, and we have a number between f of the endpoints, then there's somewhere in the middle c, such that f of c is equal to that number. So we could sketch this pictorially by drawing a picture. We'll, we'll look at, just look at the first of those two cases, because the other one's equivalent and is going to have the same reasoning. So we've got a closed interval a to b, and we've got a function that has a value f of a here, and a value f of b here, and somewhere in the middle there is a value l in between them. Okay, so we're just looking at the first one of these cases, f of a less than l, less than f of b. What the intermediate value theorem tells us is that there's a point C in between A and B such that our function is equal to L at that point. So if we were to draw our function, we know it goes through these two points here because it's continuous on the closed interval. Intermediate value theorem says we can find this point C um, such that we go through there as well. Okay, so we're going to prove this. Uh, we'll just prove it for this case. We won't prove it for the other case because it's equivalent and it's easier just to, just to consider one of them and then flip it afterwards. So just to make our lives a bit easier, we're just going to translate the entire problem down by a distance L. So I'm going to draw the same curve again, but if you like, I'm going to move my x-axis up so that it's positioned where L is um, on the other diagram. So I've just so A and B are still here and here. C is still going to be this point in between them. But now we have looking at a new function g of x is equal to f of x shifted down by L. So the new version of the function, so here's g of a, is that we have our point g of b here. Uh, so with our new version we've got g of x uh, that we want to show that C exists um, with G of C equals zero. And we also have G of A is less than zero and G of B is greater than zero. Okay, so it's gonna be a little bit easier to do this one than it is to do it directly in the original case, but we're gonna have a crack at it. So, proof, how do we go about this? Well, I think a good way to do this might be to attack it by contradiction. So we better just quickly outline our assumptions. So we're assuming that f of a is less than l, it's less than f of b. So we're doing this particular case here, i.e. g of a is less than zero is less than g of b, where g is defined just to the right here. Okay, so we'll assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove. So assume that no c exists. Uh, for which g of c equals zero. Okay, so we're going to seek a contradiction somehow. All right, so just scroll this up, get some get some space to work in. So I'm gonna sketch a little picture over the right to kind of illustrate how we're gonna go about this. So the setup we've got is we have a point A and a point B here. And we know that G of A is less than zero and G of B is greater than zero. And it's tempting to just to sketch the function in and draw it going through zero because that's what we're used to doing. But actually we don't know this at this point. All we know that our, is that our function is less than zero um, at A and is greater than zero at B. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go back and use our nested interval property again. So we're going to build a sequence of intervals. So we'll have A1 equals A a2 equals b and every time we're going to divide it in half so we're going to split our first interval into two smaller pieces um, each of the same size and we're going to choose the interval 
that has the right hand side positive and the left hand side negative. Okay, this should be possible because we're assuming there is no point for which g of x is equal to 0. So this midpoint here is going to be either positive or negative. If it's positive, we'll choose the left hand one here. And if it's negative, then we'll choose the right hand one here. Okay, so we're assuming nothing extra apart from the fact that it can't be equal to 0. So each, at each step, we're going to choose a2, and this, so this will be a2, b2. And then likewise, we'll divide that one into two pieces, and we'll choose a3, b3. Every time, we're just making sure that g of b3 is positive and g of a3 is negative. So let's just make a note of what we're doing. Create a sequence of nested intervals a1, b1 um, halving in size at each step uh, and guaranteeing or oh, in such that g of a1 is negative and g of a2 of b sorry let's try that again g of a n is negative and g of b n is positive okay so these intervals are getting smaller every time uh, by a factor of two and we're guaranteeing that the endpoints straddle zero every single time all right, so we have a sequence of nested intervals, and by the nested interval property, there is a point that is in every single interval. So there exists a point x star such that um, a n is less than or equal to x star is less than or equal to b n for all n. Okay, so we have this point. It's going to be in every single interval, so that's going to be an interesting point. So by our assumption, we know that g of x star is not allowed to be equal to zero. Okay, we assumed there is no no point within our overall interval for which g was equal to zero. So g of x star is going to have to be uh, not equal to zero also. And we'll assume without losing any generality that it's positive. Again, we'll be able to construct a similar argument if it if it's negative. So then. Because g is continuous, okay, so whenever we have a fixed value which is positive, then we know we can do some stuff with continuity. So let's draw a little picture zoomed in. So here is our x star, and we know this is g of x star here. Okay, um, and what we have is that we can choose a delta because g is continuous. We can choose a delta so that if we limit ourselves to be within delta of x star, then we can force our function to be as small as we want it to be. In particular, we can force our function to be positive by choosing an epsilon so remember we're saying um, we'll, we'll choose an epsilon value here so that we have 0 and 2 g, star, g of x star. Yeah, so the epsilon we're choosing is g of x star itself. And if we, if we choose delta, well, if we set the restriction that g of x star has to be less than, uh, g of x, sorry, minus g of x star has to be less than epsilon, which is g of x star itself, then we're going to be confined within this box here 
when we choose this delta corresponding to it. And what this actually means is that our function is positive in this entire box. So let's just, maybe I wasn't quite clear what I just said. So let's just say it in um, mathematical language as well. So because g is continuous, there exists a delta such that, whoops, get that back, delta greater than zero such that the absolute value of g of x minus g of x star Um, sorry, say that again, such that if x minus x star is less than delta, then g of x minus g of x star is less than our choice of epsilon, which is g of x star. Okay, so this g of x star here is filling the role that epsilon normally fills in our statements. And this implies, in particular, that g of x is greater than zero. Okay, so the trick is here, we want to look at our sequence of intervals now, because you can see we're going to collide two ideas here. Our intervals have been chosen so that we're straddling this point x star, we can go as close to it as we like by taking smaller and smaller intervals. But for every one of these intervals, the left-hand endpoint has to be negative, and the right-hand endpoint has to be positive. Okay, so look at any one of these intervals up here. For a2 and b2, a2 is negative, b2 is positive, a3 is negative, b3 is positive, etc. And by our construction, where the size halves every time, we can get as close as we like to x star in this way, but it has to be that a3 and b3, a n and is negative, and b n is positive. So the trick is, because our intervals are getting smaller and smaller, eventually we'll get an interval that lies entirely inside uh, our x minus delta x star plus delta box. And here's where our contradiction is going to come about, because we know that g of x is positive in this box, but our interval is going to force g of the left-hand endpoint to be negative, and that will contradict it. So there also exists an n little n, sorry, n and unnatural numbers such that b n minus a n, okay, the width of that interval is less than delta, which implies, so if we've got an interval, let's just sketch it up here, here it is, a n, b n, and the overall length is less than delta, then if we take our x star, we can see that a n is at most delta, this distance here cannot be larger than delta, in fact it must be smaller. So this implies x star minus a n is less than delta. Which in turn implies the absolute value of x star minus, or a n minus is less than delta. Okay, now the reason I wrote, I wrote it in this form here is because it's to match up with this one. And following the implication here, it then follows that g of a, or well, in particular this one here, g of a n must be positive. So g of a n is positive contradicting our construction. So what we can conclude is that our assumption 
Uh, let's go right back to what where our assumption was that we've just broken. Must be false. So hence, uh, assumption must be false. And there exists a point. C such that G of C equals zero, which is equivalent, of course, if we translate back to our original function f, that f of C is equal to L. Okay, now it's, it's I guess on some level it's not a hundred percent complete because we made a couple of non particularly onerous assumptions here. One was that G was uh, G of X L was positive. Technically, we should have covered off g of x star being negative as well, but it's kind of at this point, at this level, we could have, we could also write without loss of generality because it really is just a symmetry argument that the same thing is going to apply if g of x star is negative. Likewise, our assumption um, that we were looking at the sequence, the, the function where g of a was less than g of b, can equally well be reversed by defining a new in function which a new function which inverts them. Okay, but in the interest of, a cl of clarity of the proof, we just made those limiting assumptions that aren't actually that limiting to deal with, to avoid having to deal with irritating edge cases that just add complexity where it's not quite required. Okay, so that's the end of that.